Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. I'm Eileen McClellan, Lead Senior Scientist with the Environmental Defense Fund, EDF. And this is my colleague, Aditya Renade from Two Degrees Adapt. You'll be hearing more from Adi a little later on. As we've heard today throughout this Borlaug dialogue, including discussions earlier today led by two of my colleagues, Amanda Leland and Britt Grusman, who are here in the room, we need to grow more food to feed more people, and we need to do so in a way that works for both people and planet. Today, we're releasing a report which builds on the great work by this year's laureate, Dr. Cynthia Rosenzweig, in detailing the likely impact of climate change on our ability to grow food. Our report, done in collaboration with Two Degrees Adapt, focuses on climate impacts to the production of corn, soy, and wheat, the staple crops, in one of the most productive regions of the world, the American Midwest. We find that even with continued technological innovation, there will be significant impacts to crop production as soon as 2030, eight years from now. That's scary. The scale of impact on some of the most technologically advanced farmland in the world raises real concerns about potential impacts to food production in other regions. So I realize that this sounds like one more gloom and doom report, and we've all probably read too many of those. <laughs> Our goal at EDF, however, is to find solutions that help people and nature thrive in the face of a changing climate. So our report also looks at adaptation, and we'll hear more about adaptation and how it's being implemented when we turn to our panel. So how did we start this work? Oh, sorry. I'll also say that while everybody up here on stage is US connected, we do have a virtual panelist joining us, uh, and she's going to be here to give us the international connection because while this report focuses on corn, soy, and wheat in the US, we know that developing nations have been facing and adapting to climate change for a long time. And we think that there are lessons that the US could learn from them. So we're looking forward to hearing from Daisy in a bit. First, some background on our report. We started this work because we wanted to present information about the risks of climate change in a way that would be meaningful to farmers and the agricultural community. So we focused on near-term climate impacts, 2030 and beyond, and at a very local scale, four kilometers by four kilometers, slightly larger than the average American farm. We focused on three case studies, as we see here, corn in Iowa, soybeans in Minnesota, and wheat in Kansas. And working with Two Degrees Adapt, we combined scientific predictions of future climate impacts with interviews with technical experts and farmers to learn what adaptations are already happening and could be considered for the future. Our report is available on this website, and those of you in the room hopefully have postcards with a nice QR code on it that you can scan later to access the report. So what did we find? Well, we found that climate change will have significant impacts. Specifically, by 2030, we will see yield declines of at least 5% and as much as 25% compared to what we could produce in the absence of climate change. We also see a lot of spatial variability with climate winners and climate losers side by side in each state and sometimes even in each county. We've built an online story map, which you'll be able to access from this website. So we're now gonna take a look at the story for Iowa. So here's the state of Iowa, I know many of you recognize it. The black lines are the counties, and we have shaded in each county based on the average climate burden. That is how much climate is going to depress yields by 2030. If it's brown, there's a climate burden. If it's darker brown, there's a bigger climate burden. What you should all notice is that every county in Iowa is brown. 
<laughs> there is an impact everywhere in <clears throat> Iowa. Now, I don't know if this will work live. Uh, when you go to our story map, we have a little slider that you can drag across, and you'll see what happens. There we go, by 2050. Darker brown everywhere. Things get worse. <laughs> Now, I do need to point out that our analysis is actually optimistic because we're assuming that we continue to have innovations in technology at the same rate as we have over the last 60 years or so. And we are making pretty optimistic assumptions about emissions reductions, which may or may not come true. So things could be worse, much worse than we're showing here. The good news, though, from our report is that adaptation is already happening. We have identified adaptation approaches ranging in scale from the seed to the region. And we found examples of these in each of our case studies. So we should hopefully now see a slide that shows the range of adaptation approaches. Whoops, no, we skipped one somewhere. Never mind. There we go. Thank you. At the smallest scale, the seed or the plant, there are many emerging opportunities around crop breeding, and you've heard some of this today, genome-enabled hybrids, CRISPR, those kinds of things. There's obviously a lot of private investment in that, at least for corn at the moment. There's great interest in field-scale practices, things like precision agriculture and soil health practices, like cover crops that we see here. And we think of these as no regrets practices because farmers will benefit from using these regardless of climate change. And then there are more transformational practices, transformational because they move us further away from the current monoculture or biculture cropping system. Crop shifting, where we start to grow very different kinds of crops that are more resilient to future climates and also crop diversification. And that can happen at the farm scale or at the landscape scale. We hope that our report, by detailing the risks of climate change and the opportunities for adaptation, will stimulate the broad agricultural community to start now in planning for this work. I do want to go back, though, to one slide. Climate change is going to make it hard for us to meet our food production goals. The yellow green line shows if we extrapolate from, from historic yields over time, what one county in Iowa will be producing by, well, through 2020, and then we've dashed the line beyond 2020 to show what it would be in the future if current innovation continues, et cetera, et cetera, without climate change. The wiggly blue line shows the effect of climate change it's lower than the yellow-green line, and that's what we refer to as the climate burden. Like I say, 5%, 25%, somewhere in that range by 2030. But let's put this in the context of food security goals. If we imagine that we ask this same county in Iowa to produce enough corn by 2050 to do its part in feeding the global population we expect by 2050, we will see what's shown by the red star here. With climate change, we cannot meet that goal unless we adapt. And that, I think, is probably the most important message for us to take away. Adaptation is going to be critical for food security and we already know how to do it. We have folks on this panel who will tell us how they are doing it. And I hope that their stories will prove an inspiration to everybody in this room and beyond. So I'm now going to turn to my colleague, Addie, and we're digging in a little bit deeper on this Kansas wheat study. Could I ask you to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, certainly. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen, for um, giving me a chance to introduce uh, this follow-on study. So if you, uh, I encourage all of you to go and download the PDF, uh, use the story map, and then if you look at Kansas, it'll become obvious to you that Kansas, uh, much of Kansas is becoming hotter and drier. 
uh, if you look at precipitation patterns or uh, temperatures, um, as you go, particularly as you go from east to west. So, uh, and you can see the impact on the resultant impact on wheat yields in 2030 and 2050. So a natural follow on question is, uh, if you take all the existing crop mix of dryland corn, soybeans, wheat, is there going to be enough water? So that's exactly what we have done in this follow on work. So we have looked at uh, the impact of climate change on crop water needs, uh, on groundwater storage, et cetera, and then try to reimagine a more sustainable future for Kansas agriculture uh, and uh, asked ourselves a question, what, what does the crop mix need to look like in 2050 in order to be more in line with how much water will be available uh, so that uh, we can be in line with the water budget, increase nutrition density, keep the farmer profitability. Now, some of these changes that we uh, are envisioning, uh, like switching from corn to sorghum, are already underway and need to be accelerated. Some others, like switching from uh, partially from winter wheat to winter rye, need to be catalyzed in value chains and markets need to be developed for those. So uh, watch this space closely in early 2023. We hope to share some of those results uh, with Eileen and the broader EDF team. Great. Thanks, Addy. So now I'm going to introduce our panelists. Uh, so we start next to Addy with Stephanie Millie Grant. Stephanie is Senior Manager for Sustainability at Unilever, where she works with policymakers and NGOs to implement Unilever's sustainability agenda. Under her leadership, Unilever joined with Practical Farmers of Iowa to help soybean farmers, whose soy is a critical ingredient in Hellman's mayonnaise, one of their brands, implement adaptation practices on their fields. Next to Stephanie is Dr. Jerry Hatfield, former director of USDA's Agricultural Research Service National Lab on Agriculture in the Environment, just down the road in Ames, Iowa. He was lead author of the agriculture section of the National Climate Assessment and also served as director of the Midwest Climate Hub, helping farmers understand adaptation options. I'm going to detour a little bit to the screen here and introduce Daisy. Daisy Martinez Baron is Regional Director of Climate Change, Agriculture, and Food Security, the CGIAR in Latin America. Daisy is going to share, I hope, multiple perspectives adaptation in the international and smallholder context, bridging the gap between climate science and farmers, and the importance of co design of adaptation solutions by scientists, technical advisors, and local communities. Next, we go to Seth Watkins. Seth is the owner-operator of Pinhook Farm in Southwest Iowa, and a lifetime member, I believe, of Practical Farmers of Iowa. Seth raises corn, soybeans, winter wheat, and alfalfa, and also runs a cow calf herd. Seth is also a UN Food Systems Champion, working to advance a fundamental transformation to a more sustainable and just food system. And last, but certainly not least, Dr. Lucinda Stunkel, owner manager of Sunny Day Farms and Stunkel Farms in Kansas. Lucinda's family farm in Kansas couples a cow calf operation with growing a wide variety of crops and cover crops. She brings the experience of a farmer who is constantly adapting her operation to changes in climate, markets, and the economy. Now, the panelists got a sneak preview of an early version of the report, so they've had a few days to look at it. So I'm now going to put them, each of them, on the spot and ask them to respond in one minute apiece, basically, to one question. And the question is, what do you think is the key message the agricultural community should take away from the report? And if by the time I get to you, somebody's already said, well, I think the key message is, and that's what you were going to say, it's fine to say, I agree with whoever. You don't have to rack your brain to come up with something different. So roughly one minute each. 
Do we have a do we have a volunteer to start, or am I going to volunteer someone? Go first. So, go for it. Um, uh, first of all, I want to make it really clear: I'm a farmer, and I want to stay in my lane. And <laughs> and there are a lot of people here with different ideas on how to move our food system forward. And I know everyone here has their heart in the right place. So if I say something that upsets you, it's for the betterment of society and humanity, not to be mean. But um, <laughs> when I saw this map, or when I saw this model, I immediately thought of all the other things involved in that are facing us, from soil organic matter to biodiversity. Um, temperature alone is, you know, that's a really optimistic outcome. And what I want you to take away in a, in a sentence is that part of that is what 60 years of technology has gotten us. And that good old saying of just because we can doesn't mean we should needs to be taken to heart. Technology is important. I'm not downplaying it. But, you know, the technology of the steel plow is what eroded our soil. The technology of chemicals and, and synthetic fertilizer amassed the degradation of our soil and, and allowed us to move away from the ecological solutions we need. And I'll just stress that farming with nature does work. Crop rotations work. Getting covers, you know, following these practices reduce my input costs. So it's not just me being a tree hugger. It's about sound economics. So please take away that before we think 60 more years of technology is going to solve this problem, let's start working with Mother Nature first. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Lucinda, can I ask you to go next? Yes, I would definitely second that, that we need to work with Mother Nature instead of against her. I found that when I add diversity to my crop fields by putting uh, companion crops with my commodity crops, that I'm actually greatly reducing the inputs. I don't need um, any more insect, I don't need insecticide, I don't need fungicide, um, greatly reduce um, I haven't had herbicide. Um, it's just amazing what Mother Nature does for you when you work with her instead of against her. I always try to put some flowers in with the mixes, some forbs per se, so that I'm attracting beneficial insects and the beneficials will take care of any insect problem that I might have, but also the root exudates of this diversity that I put in with my crop. Um, the root exudates feed the commodity crop, and I don't have to buy fertilizer for that. For that. Now, the caveat is that um, when you have land that is hooked on um, chemical fertilizer, then you need to wean it off of that um, chemical, just like you have to wean a drug addict off of its drug. <laughs> um, it has killed the biology in the soil, and therefore you have to build up the biology so that the biology can work for you. And I found that about 15% reduction per year in um, lowering the, the chemical inputs is what I have had to do. I, I did try with two fields um, going cold turkey, and it was a disaster. Um, so... <laughs> Um, we need to give it time to evolve. Perfect. And the diversity is what has made the whole difference. And then it, any mistake that I make, I can solve that by grazing my livestock. <laughs> 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 and they love it. <laughs> and they work for free. And it's that much less hay that I have to make. And I don't give my livestock any grain because they are ruminants. And um, they very eagerly um, consume my weeds and my, my grasses and um, love doing it. Super. Daisy, can I ask you your thoughts? Thanks, Arlene. And, and I totally agree with Seth and Lucinda. Uh, I think that, that that's one of the key messages that, that we can take out, out of their work. Additionally, in looking for Looking from the, the Latin American context, I think that it is, um, this report has highlighted the importance of collecting high quality data at the very uh, local level that inform climate action and, and that can enable uh, considering um, the main, I mean, the key actions that we need to implement at the local level. 
We don't have that. We don't have that high resolution data at the county level, for example, in a country such as Guatemala, Honduras, and Salvador, uh, which are very important not only for Latin America but also for the U.S. And and we don't we don't have that kind of information to make decisions uh, in terms of of what uh, we can do at the very local level. And and I think that that's something very um, relevant to highlight of the report because you you have the access and you have the data that you can use to inform those kind of decisions and the practices that you can implement to adapt to climate change. Great. Thank you. Jerry, I'm going to ask you next. Yeah, I think that one of the things that comes out of this report is how fragile our agricultural system really is when you talk about the environmental changes that are going on. You look at the temperature responses and we look at the water responses. Is We're going to get to the point in which technology cannot overcome those. Mm -hmm. As much as plant breeders would like to think that they can cover every problem, is that we're going to get to a tipping point in which that is the environment's going to win. And so we're going to have to think about how we diversify. How do we look at this overall system from an entirely different perspective? What's the, what's the soil piece that, that Lucinda talks about? What are the differences in crop rotations that we're going to have to put? How do we look at adaptation strategies as well as transformative practices that you put on that slide? So I think that one piece that people need to take away is <clears throat> we need to become much more urgent about finding solutions that producers could adopt and, and begin to employ. Great. Thank you. Stephanie. Really echoing everything that's been said, I think two things that stick out to me is one on the technology pieces, and this was described to me um, by a friend of mine who's, who's a scientist who said, it's an easy button. Think about the Staples easy button the way technology has today. You plant your beans, you plant your corn, you spray your Roundup. That's all you got to do. It's more work to farm the way Seth and Lucinda does. It, it, it's more work. And when you've grown up doing it that way, it's a mindset change to really do that. And I'm seeing that as I learn from farmers and understand what they're doing. So it's, it's a very different way. I think that goes hand in hand, and, and that's the transform, transformative, what do we have to do for that adaptation piece is very key down the road and, and starting now and not waiting until it's too late. But I also think there's a policy piece on this, and it goes to the crop insurance, which was in the report. Yeah. It's got to change. We can't be focused on yields and fence row to fence row, and we're just going to plant our way out of this and get the yields. We've got to change how crop insurance is, is looked at today. I know that's not a popular uh, thing with, with many in the, in the industry, <laughs> but it really needs to be looked at. What are your practices? What are you doing for adaptation and, and looking down the road and, and your practices instead of just focused solely on your yields? Mm -hmm. And that right. is so true because I cannot insure those fields where I put companion crops and using those root exudates in lieu of a commercial fertilizer. So, yes. Thank you all. Um, so now I'm going to turn to some fairly specific questions. Um, Stephanie, hate to put you on the spot <laughs> right again. You work for a food company. Food companies are increasingly aware of climate risks. What role do you think food companies can play in supporting farmers in their efforts to adapt? I view it as a partnership, and that's how Unilever really looks at it. Um, we've been working with farmers in Iowa, for example, since 2012. First, to just understand what's going on, what are the practices, um, what are they doing? And then we started with cover crops in 2015 in a small pilot, and we, 2018, went full on with cover crops and trying to support farmers on that. So we really look at what's the local issues, how can we partner to solve? We don't think this should all be on the farmers, especially for us, because we're demanding more and more and more. We've all set our net zero targets. We've all made these big audacious goals out there, at least the big companies. We've got to have skin in the game, too. If we're going to ask this and demand this through our, through our suppliers and the farmers, we need to be a participant in it, too. And I think any company that's wanting to make these goals and achieve these things, if they aren't, if they aren't working with and learning and understanding and helping these adapt adaptation things happen, you're not going to get where we need to go. Very good. So Seth and Lucinda, and then I'll come to you as well, Daisy, on this question. So 
you all have sort of recognized the importance of diversification, whether it's diversification of crops, diversification by reintegrating livestock back into the farm, which we know here in the Corn Belt that went out of fashion in the 1950s or 1960s. <laughs> I'm wondering who you look to for help about diversification. Is that, have food companies stepped in to help with that? Have technical advisors from universities stepped in? Is it networks of other farmers? What have been your experiences of learning how to farm differently? Who has helped you with this? <laughs> when my husband and his brother, farm partner, were killed in an accident 12 years ago, um, basically we had a lot of support from our community. And it's because the, um, the, our family had helped members of that community in the past, and they were returning the favor. So it really does take an entire community um, to grow enough food for the world. And um, you just really need to work together and find people who are like you. Um, when I went to the university and asked for research on cover crops, because we started cover crops 17 years ago, um, there was no research on cover crops. And there was a dearth of it, which remains today. And so my basic information about cover crops has come from other farmers and a few innovative um, cover crop seed companies like Green Cover Seed in Bladen, Nebraska. And they um, had a smart mix calculator that is free for everybody to use. You just put in your zip code and it will give you a variety of legumes, a variety of grasses, a variety of forbs, a variety of brassicas that you can choose from that will grow in your area and you put in what um, you need your um, soil to uh, be healed from and then the, they will give you a percentage of which of these plants will help meet those needs and so you can build your cover crop mix with some science behind it because mm -hmm. they base what they learned on what they can find in the scientific literature. And that has really been a tremendous help. So it takes a whole community to build Thank that. You. Yeah, and I'm also picking up that in some cases, these kinds of digital tools that farmers can access online without necessarily having to find a kindred soul somewhere in their local area <laughs> might also be of great help. Seth, could you talk a little um, about your well, learning experience? Yeah, I mean, it, it's probably part of the frustration. So definitely from other farmers with groups like Practical Farmers of Iowa, mm -hmm. um, they've been great. Uh, Iowa State has professors that are really, really helpful. Um, but yet, you know, like the Leopold Center has been defunded. Yeah. And that's, a, that is, that's an easy, that wouldn't take a lot of money to get that going again. We turn to them often. And, and then I think one area that I really do see a disconnect is we have a lot of people visit my farm and, and you know, funders and, the, and a lot. And then they, they leave and they always say, well, what do you really need? And I said, we need scalable farms. Buy a farm. Let a group of farmers come around it and let us figure out what works. You know, it's neat doing research on our farms. But give, I don't give it to us, rent it to us, whatever, but get 600 acres or 1,000 acres. It's a good investment. And sort of like Dakota Lakes would be an example in, in South Dakota. That's where we can start to apply these things and really see them and, and work together in that community. Because sometimes on our own farms, it's, you know, there's, it's good, yeah. but I think that model would be a lot better. Right. Stacey, I'm going to turn to you because I know we've heard from our farmers this importance of community. And I know that that bringing community together to find solutions has been something you've worked on extensively. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how that's worked. Thanks, Eileen. Yes. So we, uh, we are scientists and we do research for development. And we have implemented this participatory action research approach in which we understand that we have some information, some knowledge that we can share but also we recognize the importance and the value of the knowledge of the, of the farmers of the community that we work with. And we bring all the stakeholders together to discuss uh, in a specific territory based on their context, what are the challenges and what we have in the territory and what we don't 
to address the cha those challenges. And therefore, we've been um, uh, doing research with, with the communities, with the farmers, uh, investigating what works, what doesn't, what is climate smart and what, what isn't, and, and how through the technologies, through the approaches that we have developed, uh, they can actually increase their resilience and adaptation to climate change. Some of those tools and technologies have to, we had to change them or adjust them uh, because they didn't work. They work in our field in the center, but they didn't work in the in in, in the farm with the community. <laughs> so so that so that what we uh, we wanted to to understand and be able to uh, adjust and 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 develop with them uh, so that so that they really work at the end. We have been implementing this approach across all the projects that we are implementing right now. And, um, and we have uh, successful experiences in Guatemala, Honduras, Colombia, uh, in which this actually works. And now they are uh, just working uh, with the tools, the training, the, the uh, co-generation of knowledge that we did. And they are uh, adapting uh, to climate change and climate variability uh, with the help of, of others, not only us, and they are uh, also increasing their income based on, on what they have implemented now. So. Great. That, that's fascinating. And, and I, I love the emphasis on experimenting and finding what works tailored to a particular place. Yes. I think that's going to be one of the biggest challenges, and you saw a hint of that in our maps. The challenges are going to be different from farm to farm, and the solutions are going to have to be different from farm to farm. And that's often difficult for big development agencies or government agencies to cope with that kind of spatial variability. So, Jerry, you've worked for one of those big government agencies. I'm not going to ask you to speak on its behalf at this point. Um, but, but you also worked with one of the climate hubs where the goal has been to help farmers adapt to climate change. I wonder if you could talk briefly about the climate hubs experience and the value that you see them bringing. Yeah, if you, if you look at the climate hubs as they're distributed across the, the US, they were set up to basically take information and put it into a practical form that the producers could use. And if you look at that, First, it was getting producers to understand that how variable their yields were relative to climate and that there were pieces of that puzzle as well. But then thinking about what do you need to be prepared for as the climate's changing? And so you take a much more proactive approach in saying, if the precipitation, I'll just use an example, uh, and Satorius has, has been with this one as well, and that's the fact that across the Midwest, we're seeing a, a change in our seasonal patterns of precipitation. We're becoming wetter in the spring. Yep. What that's doing is, is really influencing the number of workable field days we have in the, in the spring. And so when you have re reduced number of workable field days, that means you either face a risk or you go to bigger and bigger equipment. Look how much our equipment has expanded. Uh, and, that's, and that's a result of just a change in there, the producers have to get things done. But it also leads to a problem environmentally because sometimes things get put on, and when we get a heavy rain, we get wash off of, of fertilizers, we get wash off of pesticides, uh, we get a lot of this. So one of the things that, that we saw across the Midwest is that we have a negative correlation between average county yields and spring precipitation mm -hmm. because it delays planting, it causes bigger problems, a number of different things. So how do you cope with that? But realizing that that is a signal in there. And I think part of the Climate Hub thing is to explain the signals uh, to producers and everything. Very good. Good. So if I can put you on the spot again, Jerry. <laughs> so we've talked a lot about it's possible to adapt, <laughs> but obviously... It's not a case of waking up one morning and saying, I'm going to adapt and change <laughs> happens overnight. What do you think are some of the barriers that farmers face as they think about adaptation? Well, there are five. Five? Okay. <laughs> fewer than I thought. There are five <laughs> barriers, and this is, comes from working with a lot of on-farm experimentation, working with producers and everything else. Here's the five barriers. 
agronomic. What's it going to do to my yields of the crop I plant? So that's a barrier thinking. If I already know how to grow corn and beans, why would I want to put wheat into that system? So ag agronomically, they got that as a barrier. The other one is economic. One is, is it going to cost me money to adapt? Uh, what's it going to do in terms of my risk factors? Things that I don't understand in terms of the economic piece of this. The other one's environmental, because you do have some producers that say, you know, there's erosion coming off my fields. I've, I've, I see all these different pieces. And so they're concerned about where the soil resource. The other two are a little softer. And that is the psychological barrier. The psychological barrier is how long am I going to lay awake at night thinking about the decision I have to make? Uh -huh. That's really the essence of that. And the other one is sociological. And that is what do the neighbors think? And I always found as we went through and looked at on-farm trials, I could gauge the comfort that the producer had with that about where they would let me put that trial. Because if they thought that was going to work, it would go next to the road. If they didn't think it was going to work, it was on the back 40 that nobody could get to. And so those are the five barriers. And, and when we work with producers, you can just trip down through every one of those. They'll just tickle down through that because they'll, they'll come up with the agronomic, and then they'll come up with the economic, and then they'll come up with the environmental. Well, what's this going to do to erosion? And then they'll say, well, how do I really make this decision? And then, you know, what do people perceive about this and everything? So you can, you, it, they, those are the five barriers that I've discovered over time. Okay. <laughs> Is one particularly hard? The, the biggest one, and, and I mean, they're probably listed in order. It's the agronomic. Am I going to affect my yield? And then and the economic piece of it. Those two go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Although, interestingly enough, producers have a hard time telling me exactly how much money they make on an individual field. We don't do a good job of analyzing on a field basis their return on investment. Seth can talk a lot about return on investment. Yeah. So trying to get producers to say, are you getting return on the nitrogen you put on? Bruner's done a great job in terms of looking at spatial variation mm -hmm. of nitrogen response within field and finding out that there are parts of the field that shouldn't have any nitrogen because we're water limited. Mm -hmm. And getting producers to realize that there are changes that they could make without increasing their risk, but actually decreasing their risk and increasing their profitability. Thanks. Daisy, I'm going to put you on the spot and not asking you to pretend to speak for all countries in the world. Jerry listed five barriers to adaptation there. Are, are they unique to the U.S.? Do you have the same problem in Latin America? Or are there some factors <laughs> not mentioned that are perhaps common across Latin America that we should maybe be thinking about here in the U.S.? Yeah, well, no, I think I, I totally agree with Jerry. I think that those those are the main ones. Maybe uh, it, it changed uh, because of the context. So, so we don't have uh, much investment uh, also in terms of research. So we need that. We need to to strengthen the um, the institutional capacity of uh, the research institutions uh, that are doing that in the agricultural sector. So. So we need investment, but also long-term investment. And that's one of the key uh, barriers in, in Latin America, at least. And, and so uh, thinking about the capacity building is another one. And uh, the rural extension services that we have in the region are not well equip, equipped with tools to train partners on climate change adaptation techniques or uh, how to use uh, the technologies or what type of practices implement. So, so there's also a huge barrier that, that perhaps you, you haven't more covered than, than, than we in Latin America, but, but I think that capacity building is not something that you're doing just one time. It, it's something that you need to keep doing because information knowledge keeps, keeps evolving. And, and I think the third one is in terms of access to complementary services. It's not only the practice. It's not only to use the, the, the variety that is tolerant to, to water extract. It's the, the portfolio of practices 
that need to be implemented so that so that technology works uh, is that so the, the information that you need to manage the climate risks that you have. Uh, for example, local agroclimatic information uh, that is easy to understand and also to use to make decisions. And for example, financial products as well. Uh, it's, it's a combination of, of, uh, of things that you will need to have uh, and, and that is not always in place uh, for farmers to access to them. Good. Mm -hmm. And Stephanie, I know that your company has worked with Practical Farmers of Iowa. Um, is there a role for farmer networks, do you think? And maybe Seth can speak to this as well, in terms of helping farmers identify what the best things to do are and learning from each other? Yeah, absolutely. And I wish I had a PFI in every state I was working in, because they're such <laughs> an, a valuable resource from the agronomic. I mean, it hits off a lot of the, the things, that you, the barriers right there. Um, within that they can help provide and work farmers too. So, you know, when we set up our programs, we really have it under three pillars. There's a cost share element. So we'll, we'll cost share a practice. We provide technical assistance, whether it's a practical farmers or a university or wherever it is for the local, we try to find that local technical assistance because we want it to be somebody they understand and know and relate to and, and that person knows the area. And then the third part is this farmer network piece. Yeah. And it's so important because, and farmers really learn from each other and more so than, you know, I'm not going to, we're not, we don't farm our company, you know, we're, we make food. So the experts are the farmers and, you know, I, we know it's a great event or a really good meeting when the farmers just start asking, well, what was your seeding rate? How did you do this? How did you do that? What were you thinking when in those types? And then you, the, to me, that's a great meeting. And that's where they learn the most instead of us throwing a PowerPoint up and saying, well, this and that and da, 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 da. Um, within it. And I just think that's a really invaluable piece. And it also goes to the sociological piece of, I had a farmer almost in tears tell me how he felt like he was the odd guy out because his rows weren't nice and neat. He was doing cover crops. And that's really what that built that third pillar for us in our program is the learnings I get from the farmers of saying, hey, you know, and he was a younger guy, but he felt like they were all talking about him at the co-op during coffee or wherever it was because he was doing something different uh -huh. and really want to have that. So nobody feels you're out on an island that you've got the support, and maybe they're not next door neighbors, maybe it's two counties over, but you know, where you can have those conversations and text message back and forth and right. within that so you can and learn from each other and just have also that support network is huge. Super. Seth, do you have anything to add to that? I, 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 I have a great us. story that goes along with that. Um, my neighbor came over and said, Lucinda, your mile looks terrible. What are you doing? And I go, oh, it's okay. It's a cover crop. And then I'm going to combine the Milo off the top of it. And then I'm going to graze it. Oh, maybe I should do something like that. <laughs> so it went from a very weedy Milo patch, which really it had plants in there that I had chosen, uh, to something that might be kind of good that he might want to copy. So you need to reframe things sometimes, too, for your neighbors. Yeah. Great. Uh, so I think now we can turn to some questions from the audience, a uh, mixture of questions from audience in the room, and I think somebody's been monitoring the chat. Uh, so two things, Jerry, that I would want to maybe add to the list, and it goes back to what Lucinda said earlier, is policy wasn't on your list. I think there's some really policy impediments that we need to work on. But, but from my perspective, coming from Indiana, but it's not unique to Indiana, one huge impediment I see is land tenure. Mm -hmm. The amount of land that is rented in Indiana is 70%. <clears throat> and, it's, and it's not unique. I'm guessing Iowa is about the same. Huge. Illinois is about the same. So you've got people who are temporarily on the land. And that's getting, in my opinion, my conversation, worse. As it's no longer rented from, you know, myself to my neighbor. My kids take over, or worse yet, my grandkids take over. Suddenly, they're living in Chicago or the coast, and they hire an attorney, and they just go after the money, and the land rental turns over every year, every other year. And it's really an impediment to implementing these yeah. kinds of important changes. So mm. I'm just wondering, what are your thoughts? Uh, is that real or imaginary? How do we, how do we deal with that? I'll, I'll just chime in. I think it's very real looking at the numbers in Iowa, and there are some incredible farmers who are willing to invest on land that they don't own, knowing they might not have that lease, and, and many and some of them do that. 
We actually tried in Iowa um, for a couple of years trying to get a tax incentive on property tax. Uh, if you were doing a certain set of like cover crops and soil health practices on that land, you got a tax credit on your property tax. Unfortunately, we weren't successful in doing it, but we're trying to find these out of the box policy solutions on ways to you know, help maybe encourage those. So if the land is rented, the landowner has some incentive for their rentee to do these types of practices. But there's definitely, in my mind, policy solutions that are needed or carrots or different things to help help get these adopted. This is one of those the problems that our, our system is yielding is fewer farmers. And and we've watched that on, on our own operation. I rent most of my land and I'm really happy that we're actually gonna go just to our own farm where we feel like we can do an even better job. Um, but that would be one that, you know, not only are you losing the people, you're losing the knowledge, you're losing those things to be passed on. And I know the whole way up here, the thing that was most on my mind was, uh, I'm not hearing us talk about these nature-based solutions. I'm hearing us talk about autonomous equipment. And that's not the right direction. And, and you know, I can demonstrate that, but. Lady in the back corner. Hi, I'm Ann Tutwiler. I was the previous uh, Director General of Bioversity International. Um, and just so you know, I was told by a very large donor when I took that job that we no longer deserve to exist, that the CGIR did not need the work that we were doing. And now it's so gratifying to hear everybody talking about the importance of, of biodiversity. But my question is, so th there's a, you know, if you're in this field, you've seen many, many reports like this. Who is the audience for this and whose opinion are you really trying to change? Um, because is it the policymakers? And I think that is a big gap. Is it farmers who are still in denial, many of them, about what's happening? So I'm, I'm just curious, who, whose opinions are you trying to change and what are you trying to get them to do yeah, after well, they've read it? That's a great question. Let me try on that one. So I think... I think we want to raise awareness on the part of farmers, but we recognize that farmers are often boxed in from making different decisions, largely by policy. Also, you know, they're, they depend upon agricultural lenders who might further constrain their options. So we want to raise the awareness of farmers, but we recognize that their ability to change is going to be limited by our ability to influence policymakers, ag lenders, to get the extension community engaged and working more closely with farmers and so on. So it's a, my comms people I know are cringing as I say this. It, we're really trying to reach a pretty broad and diverse community here because it's going to take that whole community to make the change that's needed. We can't expect farmers to do it on their own. Uh, from NASA and uh, from AGMIP. Uh, Jerry, you mentioned tipping points as a, as a thing that's, that's to be concerned um, or for which we should have some concern. Um, some of the extrapolations of production trends uh, are, are in, in many ways optimistic. And what really worries me is those things that we don't see coming. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's one thing to, to come up with these biophysical limits to adaptation. Um, but, you know, there are new hazards moving into Iowa, new hazards moving into other parts of the country mm -hmm. that the people here haven't really experienced. I wonder if anybody has insights into whether we are seeing those things already or if, if there's a plan to deal with those kind of uh, unforeseen new challenges. Thanks. Well, Seth mentioned it, and I'll, I'll just bring it up. It's we, in a lot of this, don't understand or don't quantify the, the pest, the disease impact. On this, I mean, if you take a look at impacts on productivity, climate's about 50% of that signal, and, and pests and diseases are about 50%, and yet we don't pay much attention to the other 50. We just think we'll control it. But in reality, I mean, we're seeing expansions of, of uh, ranges of insects, uh, of pestis or weeds that are coming in. All of these things are either going to require more management we're, we're going to take us farther away from an ecological approach because we'll just spray it to death. Uh, so I think that becomes a great concern to us. And how do we cope with that? And that becomes the more impossible part even to model 
Alex, as we've talked about with AgMIP, is how do we look at this, the, the pest complex over time with the, the climate piece and, and looking at that? But we see expansion of ranges. I mean, we did a thing with Palmer Amaranth that, you know, it just explodes across the Midwest with the changing climate that's out there. And so the, all those things are out there. And I think we've got to understand that we live in a complex world. And what we're trying to use very simple models to explain the complexity. And it, the things that we don't understand are the much of these interactions that are going on, which always surprises, uh, you know, in terms of this. And so I think we've got to be prepared to admit that we're wrong and that we need to change directions at times and how we approach the problem. And I would add to that that, you know, what we model <clears throat> here were changes, daily changes in temperature and daily changes in precipitation and water availability to crops. But we didn't look at the extreme events, yeah. the droughts, mm -hmm. the floods, which are the things that really do the damage to agricultural productivity and which are incredibly hard to predict even a year ahead, never mind a decade ahead. And that's in part why I talked about our forecasts being optimistic. Things are likely to be much worse, and the need for adaptation is therefore that much more urgent, and the scale of transformation needed is likely to be that much greater. We're going to go now for a, a lightning round. Oh, we have one more question. Yeah, one yep. more question. Yeah, we got to have one yep. more question here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Stephanie, you, you touched the third rail, and you probably launched at least two mass press releases <laughs> about how great crop insurance is. <laughs> so tell me, because what would po you possibly want to change be knowing how much I am told how great crop insurance is. <laughs> but by all means, please go ahead and keep touching that rail for me, will you? Uh, Chris Clayton with DT and the Progressive Farmer. <laughs> I don't know what the exact solution is, honestly, um, but I know what it is today just encourage, and from, encourages yields and encourages planting as much as possible and getting as high yields as possible. And one of the concerns I, we hear on some of these adaptation for soil health practices comes down to I'm gonna, my yields are going to drop, which goes yep. into the number one. Yep. Number one barrier here is I don't want to do that because my yields may drop. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at this in a constant, what are my yields, what are my yields, what are my yields, instead of what is my viability 10 years from now? Can I continue to plant this crop 10 years from now? It's a mindset change, both within the farmers, but within industry. You know, If you look through the whole supply chain, um, it, yeah, it's definitely a third rail, um, yeah. and I don't know the exact answer of what it should be, but I think there needs to be some, some a hard look at it. And I've been told, and don't touch it. You've, you've said it, it's a third rail. I, I've been told by the industry, don't even go there. And it's got a very strong industry that lobbies very much for it in, in Washington, D.C., and they're very supportive of it, including a lot of the commodity groups. But I think if we, we want to be real on what's the future, and are we really going to have soils and farms and, and be able to produce, we've got to start looking at what it is. And I look at to get systemic change and what we really need to do. I, I call it a puzzle. You have puzzle pieces. Everything's, policy is a piece. Crop insurance is a piece. Um, as technical, you know, all these different pieces need to come together to really get to where we need to be. It's not just one massive solution, but policy is going to have to be a big piece within that. Then that's causing me to reflect for those of you who were here and heard Samantha Powers talk this morning. She kept stressing through that. We have to think through what we grow and how we grow it and how that's going to need to change in the future. Yep. And certainly many people have spoken to the difficulties of changing what we grow and how we grow it that are posed by the current crop insurance system. So we're going to go to a, a lightning round to wrap up here. Um, I'm going to give each of you one minute to respond to this question. I'll actually pose the questions two slightly different ways. You can pick up on either version. What would you like to see happen as a result of this report? Or what needs to happen to make sure that this report leads to action on the ground? In other words, this has been a great conversation. We hope lots of people will read our report. But for us, the outcome that matters is change on the ground. How do we get to that? Who would like to go first? 
I'll jump in. I think from a food company perspective is we need to get together as com food companies even, and we all have our own projects and programs and different things, but we all need to be talking the same, asking the same thing out of the farmers and really coming together also within that. Um, I know that's a challenge with, you know, as we all have certain regions, but wherever we can come together and speak together as one voice on, on and working together to help farmers make these transitions, I think that's a huge thing. Yeah. yeah. I'd like us to see that farmers can lead in addressing climate change and the importance of empowering farmers to do this and doing that through exactly what we're seeing through Unilever, seeing through Practical Farmers of Iowa. But also, again, I'm going to keep hammering down that importance of us having regional farms that we come together and do this practice on. Daisy, how would you respond? I would say that this report is an input for enabling discussion, discussions at different uh, scale. And, and I think that, that that's one of the tasks maybe that you have now is to bring those results and, and try to get the conversation going, get discussions to, to touch those key aspects, that those barriers as, as well that we need to address. And, um, and, and use that to enable conversation okay. and, and discussion around it. Great. Lucinda? I would like to see um, a, a, a laundry list of things that we can do to um, solve this problem, uh, crops that we can grow instead of what we're growing now. For example, I don't grow corn anymore because I don't have irrigation, and I'm not going to get irrigation. And so I grow sorghum instead um, in my rotation. I would like to see um, plans for um, uh, rotations that include a lot of crops, including ones that are not covered with um, by crop insurance, because I can only get crop insurance on corn, soybeans, wheat. Yeah. Um, and so that really limits the diversity of what I can grow and still ensure. I would like to see um, the um, crop insurance on vegetables because that's what we eat directly. Um, and I would like to see um, the extension people and the um, soil conservation people trained in these alternative methods that will help solve this climate change. So when I go to my local county and ask for help, sincerely wanting to improve and to change, that I have some experts who know how to do it, and there are some, some guidelines that work in my region on how to solve these problems of the intensifying temperature and less water for my crops. And Jerry? Yeah, that's not a simple question. No, I know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know. But I'll give you a, a relatively simple answer, and that is that I think we've, and, and it plays off of what Seth said about tours that have regional farms, but it's not regional farms that are designed by somebody else. It's regional farms that are designed by the producers in that community. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they really drive what's important to them and that they are the stakeholders in that operation. And then we help them achieve that goal. Yeah. And so I think that, that really gets us a long way down the road. You can have discussions about the changing climate. Uh, I've got a group of producers I work with in Kansas that, that do exactly that. We have a lot of discussions about where they're at and where they need to go, and they're, they're, we're under continuous improvement, adaptive management approach. And so we're seeing all sorts of things, and, and we've got a lot of wild ideas that these guys want to try and get us uh, and all of this, but it's a matter of how do we, how do we backstop them so they, we can do some risky things out there that push the envelope, and yet we've, that we are scientifically defensible and being able to understand what is really happening. I like that, and I'm picking up on the word risk. You know, I think it's, it's natural for all of us <coughs> to try to avoid risk, and I think maybe the challenge we're facing with climate change is deciding which is the bigger risk, doing <laughs> nothing <laughs> and accepting the impacts of climate change, or taking a risk and experimenting and learning what will work. And we need the system to support us in that risk taking. Mm -hmm. So we'll close with that. I want to thank all of the panelists for this really rich discussion. <laughs>